Asalaamu As Alaikum everyone. Thank you for coming out even with um, the air out tonight. So just reminding everyone to stay safe. Um, and today with me are these amazing women that I hope to grow up to be. So thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, before I started out talking about uh, today's election, I kind of wanted to start start um, talking about a couple years ago when we all felt hopeless and I wanted to talk about it through a young Muslim's perspective as there are many young Muslims out in the crowd today. Um, pers oh, personally, my own story, I remember this was a couple years ago, I mean we all remember this, the San Bernardino attacks. So when the San Bernardino attacks happened, I was, I was a sophomore in high school. And I remember seeing all the developments on the news coming on my phone. Um, and I was, I was sitting in my English class. And when the shooting happened, I remember my stomach dropping. And I was praying to God. I was praying to Allah, saying, you know, I, please, please don't let me, someone who's Muslim, someone who, or claims to be Muslim. I was praying. I was praying. Um, and then when, when the, the shooter's identity came out, I just broke down crying. And around that same time, um, I know most of you are familiar with the Rahma Foundation here, which is a great program for girls. I was a part of the Halakha program as well. And my, the girls in my Halakha group started messaging on their group chat saying, I'm scared, to, I'm scared to walk home. I'm scared. I'm scared to go outside. I don't know what to do. And that's, that's where, in the first time in my life, I, I mean, we've all experienced this as Muslim Americans, where we've all feel, felt oppressed and felt scared to go out. But that, for me, was the first time that I felt like someone was going to go out and attack me for being Muslim. And I walked out of my high school crying, unable to look at anyone in the eye. And when the election happened, I also cried. This, there was this constant sense of hopelessness. This, even, even when um, we see small wins, I still felt hopeless. And we'll fast forward on a couple of years, and now we have all these historic women winning these elections, and I feel, I feel optimistic. And I, to be honest, I didn't see this coming, but at the same time, in my heart, I knew something was going to change. So I'm really glad that we had this amazing election. And most of all, what I'm glad is seeing women stand up for themselves. Seeing minority women for the first time stand up and say, I'm not taking any of this. I'm going to win without any support. And that's what I applaud um, Sabina and Aisha sister, for doing, doing all this without any support, without any backing. Um, so. To start off tonight, I have one question for you guys. Um, kind of like going off of um, my story, I guess. When did you realize that you wanted to run? What, like, what moment in your life saying, you know, I have to do this? Good evening, and thank you for having me. And uh, you know, thank you for sharing your story because I know it's not easy to share a personal story and your personal feelings. So thank you. Um, you know, honestly. I have always historically been involved in community work. Um, my, my parents have always, even at your ages, right? Um, I was told that this is part of our culture and I'm a very proud Afghan American. Um, one of the things is that you, you help where you can. Doesn't matter where you come from, you always, always help where you can, whether, you know, I remember Hurricane Katrina happened um, and I just wanted to help and I wasn't exactly sure what I could do um, and when you see uh, people without shelter in the streets you know you you try to do the most you can for them um, so being being very much involved in that side we, we specifically have ingrained both my sister and I uh, to work in the community so I ended up working for volunteering a lot and it's very very important to volunteer you are exposed to so much that you could be doing, um, both career-wise and so forth, um, and eventually getting more involved in certain nonprofits I cared about. Um, you know, getting more involved in community, as I mentioned, and eventually learning that all the community work that you do is based on a policy. 
So, for example, I worked with a lot of women in uh, shelters um, because of domestic violence. And you realize what are the policies to help these women find uh, housing? What are the policies to protect these women, to make sure that their children have a roof over their head, to make sure that they, they know their rights as a human being? Um, these were certain policies that, that I was concerned about, and I realized that it's policy makers that we need to inform. So, for example, when we, um, after 9-11 even happened, um, and being an Afghan American, one of the biggest things is that whatever they were depicting on television is not my community. It's not how I was raised. It's not how, it's a small fragment of what they glorify on television. And being more involved with policymakers, your local Congress members, your uh, local city council, your local um, different community uh, leaders, if you will, you realize that it's your job, 100%, it is your job to inform these policymakers about you and your community, your needs. So when somebody says something completely incorrect about your community, whether it's the Afghan community, whether it's the Muslim community, whether being a woman, uh, whether being a millennial, you correct them and you say, I'm so sorry, I think you're misinformed. This is the reality of my community. This is the needs of my community. And I ended up doing that more and more and more uh, and representing more communities. And eventually I, I said, you know, I, I think that it's time for us to become policymakers and really talk about some of the issues affecting the local city of Hayward. Now, um, I think that President Donald Trump plays a big part of that because of the, the hateful rhetoric that he spews very openly and, um, you know, I think that I had enough is enough. Um, you know, that's not in my community. And, and specifically, I was told by electeds in this Bay Area, one of the most liberal areas you can think of, not to say you are Muslim, not to say you are Afghan. And my last name is Wahab. My first name is Aisha. Okay. And they said that it's a, it's a very religious name. You know, she must be. Uh, a Wahhabist, right? Um, and the thing is that they don't even understand what that means. Um, you know, they, they talked about, do you want to live by Sharia law if you are elected? And some of the emails that we received were very shocking. They, and some people even posted on our Facebook page, a vote for Aisha is a vote for Sharia law and female genital mutilation. Those were some of the things we battled. And the reality is we never stop talking about the fact that this is not what I believe in. I am an American just as much as you, born and raised, and I want to do good for my entire community. So that, that is really kind of what, you know, some of the things that we went through and why we decided to run is because we feel that we have an opinion that really matters. So our voice matters. That was really powerful, Aisha, and I thank you for sharing that, and thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, my story is a little bit different as to why I decided to run. So I'm a first-generation immigrant. I did not grow up here. I grew up in Pakistan, but I grew up in a family which was very, very involved in public service. I grew up watching my father very much involved, and then I moved, you know, in, in my late teens, early 20s, I moved to the U.S., um, so I had a very typical life, got married, uh, I went to college, had my kids, started a job, um, kind of, you know, life continued. Um, and then I got, I met, actually, I met Congressman Eric Swalwell when he was first running. Um, and I decided to volunteer for his campaign. And when I volunteered for his campaign, what I felt was a sense of belonging again, which, which I had been missing for me for a long time. And, and I realized that I'd lived here long enough where it was very important for me to get involved in my community, to serve my community. And I just, you know, I was working in technology. I had, you know, really no plans of running for office, but I'm like, yeah, someday I'll get involved with my community. I'd always been, I'd always served on boats. I'd always been the PTA mom. I'd always uh, volunteered at events, um, always helped with fundraisers, breast cancer walks, all those things. But I really never had thought about running. 
And then um, I just started talking about it. And before I knew it, one thing led to another. And I started getting more and more involved in the community. And the more I started getting involved in the community, and this was right around the time uh, when I moved to San Ramon, and it was about half the city it is. So what you see of San Ramon 10 years later today, it's a very diverse community. It's a, uh, it wasn't like that. And slowly I started, you know, kind of seeing a migration of people that look that were more diverse in San Ramon. And yet when I got, saw the city council, it in no way represented anybody that lived in San Ramon. And I, as I got more involved in you know, serving on city committees, got involved in leadership and things like that in San Ramon, what I realized was that it was just made of a group of 100 or so people that were plugged in, that were bringing their own people every time they, you know, they wanted somebody um, to be, you know, in office or on commissions and on committees. And the entire city was kind of everybody else who was moving to the city was siloed, didn't know what was going on. Um, and then when I talk, started talking about running, I'm like, yeah, I would like to serve on the council because I think this community needs representation of people who somehow look like them as well and first generation immigrants. And like I said, I belong and I'm as much of an American as anybody else who's lived here three generations, four generations or 10 generations. And I started getting a pushback saying, it's not your turn right now. You have to wait. We're going to tell you when you should run for council. And that did not sit well with me. And I'm like, so I have to seek permission now to run for council. And um, I started talking to, you know, something with, which is common with both myself and Aisha. We went through this program called Emerge California, uh, which really empowers women for, to run for office. And I remember one of the first things they say, you're going to be told by, you know, it's not your turn yet. And you don't listen to that. So um, I ran in 2016. Um, I did, you know, I decided, I, I decide, and my family decides when it's my turn. I ran in 2016. I got a lot of pushback from the establishment. Uh, they made sure that they told everybody um, to vote against me. They actually set up somebody. Um, it was going to be two men and myself, and then they set up somebody last minute to run against me, a woman, who just to kind of take away the votes. Um, so they did pretty much everything um, to make sure I didn't win that election. Um, and I lost that election, but I won quite a significant number of votes. And I said, I'm not going to sit back and rest. It was also the same around the same time um, that, you know, it was 2016. It was a sad day for a lot of us. We were just, I was more in shock of what had happened to our country than what, had, you know, happened in my election. Um, and after, after 2016, things kind of turned around and changed. And what I saw between 2016 and 2018, there were Muslims became active. Muslims woke up. Women woke up. There were so many grassroots groups that decided enough is enough. And this entire movement started where we said, we're not going to sit back. We're not going to um, you know, be a quiet voice on, in there. We're going to go and do something and, and take on. And I think Trump was a blessing in disguise for a lot of a lot of people who did not care before, who did not engage before. And this election turned out to be tremendously different than 2016 because we saw almost a 50% voter turnout in San Ramon, where um, historically you've only had 20% people come and vote in an off-year election. So for me, even in this election, since I didn't listen the first time around, there was a lot of opposition from the establishment. There was opposition from the person who was, you know, he was supporting somebody else. And I really went to the voters and I went, went to the people and I canvassed and worked hard and people believed in it. And the best thing, you know, so I like to quote, my biggest supporter was a former mayor, you know, as typical as you can get a white haired, tall white guy who said, I would like to see a Muslim Pakistani in office because he, he came to the mosque and he was respected so much. And that to me was a win when somebody like that can say, I would like to see a Muslim Pakistani. And that's not my only identity, but it is a source of pride for me that I got that kind of support from the community and they saw Muslims as partners, not as somebody that Trump was making them out to be.
Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, another question that I have for you guys is, I know you, during, your, during your campaign you've talked about all the, um, I'm sure you've talked about all the things that you hope to do and um, how you hope to represent this community. But for tonight's sake, I would like you guys to kind of like uh, talk about that again. And now that you see yourself in that place, how, how you feel after that win and also um, what you hope to do in the next uh, couple of years. So um, my campaign had a very bold platform, uh, something that most people don't typically talk about and attack. And people, I, I just want to say that our campaign team consisted of mostly women, very young people, no consultant, no expert. This was just literally us sitting at a table and saying, what does the community need? So my campaign managers, Nergis Gizada, who's, who's sitting right here, put up your hand, right? She is a mental health therapist. She has no background in politics, nothing. And uh, many people on our team were first time volunteers, first time uh, you know, involved in a campaign or just motivated because of the, the hateful rhetoric out there. Um, and the thing that we talked about the most in the city of Hayward is um, housing. We know that if you have a roof over your head, you can focus on your family, you can focus on your business, you can focus on your education, and you can focus on your future. But we know that housing has become more and more unattainable for many, many people. Um, specifically in Hayward, uh, when we talked about housing, it was something that people said stay away from. It's very, very difficult to talk about housing. A lot of people feel differently about housing, and we had specific goals that we wanted to push through. Now, uh, being now an elected individual, um, it's different on, on this side of things, what you're really able to do, what you're able to push forward, and you are one vote of many others. You have to get the rest of the city council members to agree with you to definitely make sure things pass. Now, I just had um, coffee with uh, one of my opponents who is also my colleague, Sarah Lamden, who's sitting in the back. And uh, Sarah and I actually discussed some of the, the goals that you know we wanna work together on. So one of the things is, Definitely in campaign mode, you, you have to basically win to get anything done. And now that we've won, now the goal is how can we work together? It's a very, it's a, politics is filled with a lot of awkward moments, okay? Just being able to talk to each other and say, we're gonna move past this particular um, chapter of our lives, right? Because we don't know who's gonna win, right, at, at the time. So you, you really just try to avoid people and. and you know, to try to stay focused. Now, I believe that we can definitely make a significant impact in Hayward regarding housing. And people like Sarah, who's on the council, as well as myself, we will definitely bring that issue to the forefront and make it a priority. A priority in my sense being part of our campaign was making housing affordable to all at all income levels. People deserve a roof over their head, regardless of how small it is. They deserve a roof. That's a human right, in my opinion. And um, that was something that we truly, truly believe in. It's something that we will definitely work hard for. And uh, I do believe we can make it happen. So that's my number one issue that we talked about. Um, so San Ramon, um, I think one of the most important things for me in San Ramon and coming from a background in technology is that how are we helping people or giving them back the three hours that they spend on the road right now? And how are we working in partnership with larger Bay Area, with the larger Bay Area where people who live in San Ramon, who live in the Tri-Valley and commute all the way to uh, Palo Alto or San Mateo or San Francisco. Um, I've lived that pain. I've done that and I know how much it affects my quality of life 
and how much I was not even able to give back to my community, let alone my children. So for us, for the larger Bay Area, that's the problem I see is something we really need to start solving by building partnerships, by talking to other businesses and trying to see how do we bring technology jobs to the Tri-Valley? How do we partner with businesses and say, let people work from home or work from remote locations, satellite offices in the Tri-Valley? Because that is going to solve the larger issue. One, the quality of life. Like getting those three hours, there is no substitute for getting those three hours back in your life and being with your family and kids and being able to spend it. That will build community. That is going to give uh, get people more involved in your city. And that's going to build better family lives as well. Plus, what we're going to also, what that's going to help with is uh, easing traffic on 680, both going up and down the corridor, whether you go north or south. So for me, solving that traffic problem and using technology as, as a way to solve those problems would be very, very important. I am very invested in a smart city initiative. It is a long-term initiative. It is something that's going to take five to 10 years to really implement. But for me, that is, that is an important one. The other important thing for me is San Ramon has been, uh, the city council has been a very close council. Uh, people don't know what's going on. People have been frustrated that they have no way to communicate with the citizens. People have been frustrated that, uh, you know, decisions get made on city council. So opening up that communication and finding ways to go and engage with the community is, is a really important um, issue for me again, that how, do, how am I present in the community and I'm getting feedback. And I am not sworn in yet, but every single day I've been getting emails from people and I've been replying to them and I've, I've been talking to the city manager. So I already see that communication channel has opened up, which wasn't there with, with the other city council members. Thank you so much for sharing that. Housing and um, um, traveling, traveling is very, I, th I think there is something that hit home for a lot of us, I guess. Because even in, in Pleasanton, Livermore, Dublin, housing is, is very difficult to find. That's something that's affordable for a lot of our residents here. And commuting, we all see all, all the residents here. We all see that. And uh, my next question would be, um, I think in the past couple of years, we've seen that it's really hard. We've faced, as a community, we've faced a lot of difficulty in um, building bridges. I mean, we have many successes, of course, through interfaith, um, through events like this today. Um, but in order to have such historic wins like yours, um, you must have had a lot of support backing you up. And what my question is, uh, how, did you, how were you able to build those bridges in this first place because for a lot of us it seems kind of like you know it seems hard um so we would like to ask for your tips and um how you were able to combat that um you know i just want to very clearly state that we are no different from anybody that sits next to us there is literally no difference you know, I think because we are in um, a place of worship that I can easily say that um, any religious teachings teaches you that God has made us all equal. We know that. Um, with that being said, I, I just want to say that we have a lot of assumptions about people. You know, we and it's every single person has a bias against something, whether you have an accent whether you have a different skin complexion, whether you have a funny name, you know, we like to say that we're different in this sense. But deep down, for the most part, we have the same core desires. We want to raise our families in a safe place. We want to pursue education. We want a future. We want grandchildren. We want all the same things, we want a roof over our heads. Those are the things that we need to focus on as to what makes us the same. And, um, you know, I, I will say that we, we've had historic wins for specifically the Muslim community. 
Um, I can 100% say that uh, I am the first Afghan American ever elected to the United States public office, including another young woman uh, named Safia Wazir who uh, won in New Hampshire. And these are historic wins for my personal community. Now, I didn't think that it was a big deal early on. You know, I said, okay, good, we have a win. But as I've met more and more older folks from my community that have said to me that you've literally cracked the ceiling and you have allowed us to hold our head high. After 40 years of being in this particular country, we've had a win. And I'm very, very proud to say that I was a part of that. But I also want to say that our team was made up of a lot of different ethnicities. We had volunteers that were white. We had volunteers that were black. We had volunteers that were um, um, Hispanic, as well as, um, you know, of different religious backgrounds and things like that. None of that matters in America when you really talk about the issues and community as a whole. There is no other country in the world that a young Afghan girl can be raised in. And mind you, I grew up in foster care. I grew up in a very different background than most people. I should be seen as very much as less than. But in this country, every single one of us has a voice that's considered equal as long as we use our voice. So I will say that we've had other individuals within the Muslim community that um, do wear the hijab, that ran for office and did not win. And again, we are in one of the most liberal areas in the United States. And I, I truly believe that some of those things were because of how they're perceived. There's still a lot of prejudice out there. And my goal is definitely to talk about it, talk it out, about it in a very bold way. You know, I'm not going to shy away from the fact that um, we come from a different ethnicity, we speak a different language, our parents have an accent. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Be proud of who you are, and as long as you can say, yeah, so, I'm still going to do it. That is kind of the big thing that you need to do to even start to build those bridges. Once you accept yourself, other people are forced to accept you. That is one of the biggest things that I, I do want to share. For me, building bridges is opening up your house and stepping up and stepping out of your comfort zone and make, making that first move to embrace people. For me, when I talk, San Ramon is a very, very diverse community. We have 135 languages that are just spoken at our high school. So if you think of it, we're the entire United Nations in a small, in a small city. And we have so many different cultures and how do we celebrate those cultures and how do we embrace them? But how does somebody else know who we are? So for me, the most important thing is when I'm celebrating something, when I'm celebrating Eid, I go and give a packet of chocolates to every single neighbor who lives in my neighborhood. And when I talk to the mosque in San Ramon, that's what I tell them. I'm like, when we are celebrating something, let's make sure that all of our neighbors know that we're celebrating and celebrate with them. Just like that, when it's their holiday, let's celebrate with them. And let's celebrate other people's cultures and embrace that because that's what really breaks the barriers. That's what really opens up people and people embrace you because you're celebrating their culture and they're celebrating yours. Have coffee with, with them. Ask your colleagues. Ask somebody if you feel somebody's hesitant, somebody's curious. Sit down with them. Talk to them. Let them know what's important because in the end, it's all about people's relationships. People, once they build that relationship, they don't see you as white, black, brown, yellow, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, or any of that. I once got a call um, during the election. Somebody called me and said, um, I just want to know whether you are a Hindu, Muslim, or a Christian. And I said to him, I'm like, when you need that pothole fixed, is that going to ask you for your religion? And he laughed about it. And he's like, okay, you've earned my vote because that's exactly what I wanted you to say, that you care about me as a citizen of San Ramon, and it's not going to matter to me, and it's not going to matter to me anymore what religion you are. So we really have to 
talk about and understand what's important to everybody. We have, the, we have all the common issues. We have all common things that matter to us. So engage with, with you know, we need to engage with each other at a human level. And that's when you really break the boundaries. So um, thank you for all your insight. And I feel like it's very important that, um, that we have this today. And I'm really glad that you guys were able to come out today and talk to the residents. And um, I hope that after that, we all get to talk about how we can all um, support you and how we can work with you to make our make sure that our voices are heard. And thank you again for all these amazing and historic wins. Um, for all the youth that are out there, I know that we're all feeling really inspired. So inshallah, in the next like couple of years, we'll be all running. We'll be following your footsteps, inshallah. Um, and today, so we have um, to celebrate your wins. As a whole community, we have um, some amazing cakes that we bought, and we would like all of, all of us to come together and celebrate. <laughs>